practices I've done this. <laughs> All right, good morning everyone. I um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Ryan and Nikia. Gregory has been working with the group for the last eight years. <laughs> I must count. Um, so so it's, it's very it's a, a super uh, See, that's our time for me because uh, he's done a good job and he sent you to move on and leave. Uh, and I'm happy for him for that, but at the same time, he's sad for uh, you losing a great, great member of the group. Um, Ryan Hart, uh, he's, he's worked uh, um, maybe as a research assistant first and then in the former research in the group. But before that, he completed a master's in a bachelor's in instrumental music, funding a project on geophysics, but then he switched to geothermal. And I was like, hold on. Um, no funny internet, but, but it was it was a welcome uh, the welcome change at the time. And with that, I'll give it to Steve Sunny. Thank you for the kind introduction, Guillermo. Uh, all right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rian. Today, I will present an overview of what I've done in the last four, four years or so. Australia is facing an energy crisis. Energy prices are increasing. We have dirty electricity and summer blackout is expected. If you Google Australian energy crisis, this is one of the most recent article. It does not look good, does it? This article basically says that energy prices are increasing. Not only that, our electricity is dirty. Australia relies on coal for electricity generation and we are listed at the 12 most carbon emitters per capita in the world. If we don't do anything, our future is, will be threatened with limited, expensive, and dirty electricity. What can we do? 50% of the world's total energy consumption is for heating and cooling use. And from this, only 10% is from a renewable energy. So there is a room for, for improvement. One technology that might help us is by using ground source heat pump system. So in winter, we have water circulated inside this ground heat exchanger. The, the water will pick up heat from the ground, and by using the heat pump, this will be upgraded to provide heat to the building. In summer, the reverse happened, where heat from the building is moved into the ground. This technology is more efficient than typical air condition. The efficiency of this technology comes from the fact that the ground temperature is constant all year round. In Melbourne, this is around 18 degrees Celsius. As you can imagine, extracting heat from an 18 degree ground should be more efficient than extracting heat from about 10 degree air, just as a typical air condition works. Ground source heat pump efficiency has all coefficient of performance have been reported to be around four. This means that four kilowatt hours of thermal energy can be provided to the building for one kilowatt hours of electricity required to run the heat pump. The popularity of this technology has been increasing. Lund and Boyd reported that in 2016, 50 gigawatt of heat pump has been installed in 48 countries. The leaders are US, China, and Sweden. When I was in Sweden last year, I was told that one heat pump is installed at every second house. This is also a growing industry in Australia, one of which is just around the corner. Inside this wooden box, there is a 30 kilowatt heat pump that is used to provide heating and cooling to the computer life at this small proposed building. However, Australia has still, held, still has a long way to go. This PhD journey has allowed me to see some problems. First, our ground source heat pump industry is still young. There is a lack of guideline and reference data, including low awareness of all the stakeholders involved. Second, there is a lack of qualified designers and installers. So much so that I have to get my hands dirty. Here is a picture where I hope to manufacture some slinky loops in New South Wales. <coughs> the first two problems lead to a very high installation cost. Installers often mark up the installation cost to account for race, which resulting in high uh, lifetime costs and long payback period. Furthermore, there is a limited financing option. Currently, there is other, some form, other form of subsidy that are available for other renewable energy, such as solar, wind, and hydro but not yet for geothermal system. All of these problems lead to the overall objective in this research. Basically, we want to further the ground source heat pump systems industry in Australia, both for individual and district application. 
Corresponding to the research objective, this presentation is divided into two sections. The first part is about our monitoring project where we monitor the performance of some current source farm systems around the state. The second part is about to improve the viability of current source farm system. This is through the use of hybrid or district system. Hybrid system is when ground source heat pump system is used with conventional system. When district system is, is when individual ground source heat pump in nearby buildings are combined together. Let's start with the first part, which is about the monitoring project. <coughs> we know that ground source heat pump systems are commonly utilized overseas, especially in the cooler northern hemisphere countries. But the availability of high quality data sets are still limited. And this is even more so in Australia to do the number of installations that we have. Hence, we started this full-scale experimental project called the SEPD program. The Sustainable Energy Pilot Demonstration Program was funded by the local government and ran from 2012 to 2017. This is the largest geothermal performance monitoring program in Australia, where we want to demonstrate the efficiency of ground source heat pump system. This is where the properties monitored are located. Most of them are located in metropolitan Melbourne, but there are some that are located further away. These properties were chosen to cover the four <coughs> most dominant geologies in Melbourne. One contribution from this project is the monitoring of ground temperature. Our measurement has revealed that the ground temperature can vary as much as from 16 to 19.5 degrees Celsius. This is quite a significant range and quite a different than the 18 degrees Celsius that designers typically use for design. If you design with the wrong ground temperature, then it can lead to an inefficient system and high installation cost. We installed different types of closed loop ground heat exchanger. So in this one, we have a vertical loops and we have a horizontal loops with straight pipe and a horizontal loop with slinky pipes. As you can see between the middle and right picture, the soil has different color. So these two properties are installed at a different geology. We also use different ground source heat pump. The one on the left is one that is available to purchase off the shelf. However, they are rarely sold in Australia and need to be imported from overseas. The whole process from ordering, manufacturing, testing, and delivery can take up to three months, which is no good for your project. For this reason, we also trialed some locally made heat pumps. So just showing the one on the right. This one is actually designed so that all these uh, required components such as circulation pump, tank, and so on, actually installed inside the heat pump itself. So it's very compact. Sensors were installed in each of the property to measure the ground source heat pump system performance. Several thermistors were installed around the ground loop to measure the temperature around the ground heat exchangers. We have flow meter and thermistor to measure the temperature and flow rate of water going in or out of the heat pump, power meter to measure the power consumption of the heat pump itself, and finally, all these sensors are connected to a data locker which can be remotely accessible. Most of the properties were monitored for three years. Some of those sensors were installed by myself, so I had the opportunity to learn about different types of sensors, how to work with them, and what can be done to protect those sensors. The analysis of this data was conducted in Python that I created. So let's go through some of the key results. In here, we have the daily thermal energy from one of the property as shown in this map here. In the y-axis, we have daily thermal energy in kilowatt hours and then monitor time in the x-axis. As you can see here, in this particular property, the heating use represented by the red lines are significantly more than the cooling use represented by the blue lines. One observation here that the use of the system in this property are actually quite limited. As you can see in this period and that period, that there are several consecutive days that the occupants did not use the system at all. It turns out that the temperature was nice enough that the occupiers did not use any additional heating and cooling system. It was enough to just open the window for fresh air. Overall, it was discovered that this property, heating and cooling system, was only used about 6% of the year. One example is on this day when the daily thermal energy is the highest, which is just under 80 kilowatt hours. For a nine kilowatt system, this means that the system only used about nine hours in a day at equivalent full load capacity. This means for the rest of the time, either the system was not used or did not operate at the full capacity. It turns out that the low usage fraction applies to all the properties monitored here. 
As we can see from most of the properties we monitored, the run friction was between 10 to 20%. A typical design method, which assumes that heating and cooling are required all year round, and this is typically depending on the temperature at the outside of the house, assume that the expected usage in Melbourne is about 80%. The temperate climate in Melbourne is actually mild enough result that which results in minimum heating and cooling use throughout the year. Hence, for such a climate, the actual runtime of the system can be significantly lower than expected. The coefficient of performance are provided here. This is a measure of efficiency and depending on the amount of thermal energy provided to the building in relation to the electrical energy consumed by the system. Unfortunately, there are several systems which have relatively low efficiency, such as the one installed here. Those are the properties that were retrofitted with the locally made heat pump. Unfortunately, it turned out that it did not perform as well as expected due to do the limited amount of research and development that has been put up to this heat pump. Although it was not known at the design stage, but this property ended up separately under design. Despite that, all the COP that we measure are between 2 to 4.9, which is in line with all other COP measured from other experiments around the world. Based on the data we have collected, we observe several internet interesting behavior and how people use their heating and cooling system. For example, one extreme during decent heating season would be those who turn on their uh, heating throughout the night, like me. There are others who turn off their system at night to save the energy. There are also others who turn on the system manually, like the one shown in the picture with a remote. So you only turn it on when you need, and this is how the property owner from the one from the one I showed you before use their system. On the other hand, you can use an automatic thermostat that requires a lot more heating and cooling system, such as how the temperature in this lecture theater is controlled. This user behavior can significantly heating, impact heating and cooling demand, which is not often considered during the design process. One example where the heating and cooling demand can affect the ground temperature. Again, I used the example from the house that I've shown previously. Um, as you can see here, this property uh, during the heating season, as we extract thermal energy from the ground, the ground temperature decreases, and we have a lot more heating use during winter compared to the, the cooling use during summer. During summer, as you move the heating to the ground, as you can see that the ground temperature slightly increases. One, one exception is at this point, where the, we conduct a thermal response test with one of our past PhD students. This is when we circulate hot water to the ground for several consecutive days. And that's why the ground temperature increased significantly. This was done to measure the uh, ground uh, thermal conductivity. So we have a lot more high heating use compared to the cooling use. As you can imagine, this means that we extract a lot more thermal energy from the ground than what we put back later on during summer. <coughs> you might expect that because the heating use is much more than the cooling use, the ground temperature should decrease over time. We extract more than what we put back. In this case, in this property, the ground temperature managed to stay around the undisturbed level, which is about 18.1 degrees Celsius. So this leads to some key lessons that we have learned during this project. Firstly, the ground temperature vary more than what we originally thought, from 16 to 19.5 degrees Celsius. The efficiency of the systems that we monitor are comparable to other systems worldwide. However, from the properties that we monitor, they have relatively lower run fraction compared to what is expected. Finally, user behavior might impact the performance of the system. A low usage may be good when ground temperature can stay relatively constant. However, an energy efficient system might not yield much financial benefit if it's barely used. This leads to the second topic, where such a hybrid system may be beneficial in Australian temperate climatic, climatic conditions. We are a large country, and this has caused our climate to vary as much as tropical climate in the north to a cooler climate such as in Hobart. For this reason, seven major Australian cities are selected to cover all possible climatic conditions in Australia. In this research, I simulate the heating and cooling demand for a typical house 
using energy plus. However, I assume that the same building is simulated under different climatic condition. In reality, the house should be constructed slightly differently based on the local design code. However, I just assume the same for simplicity and to save time. I will consider both lifetime cost and emissions, but I will start by discussing the cost first. This is the simulation results. Different climates have different energy requirements. So it's not surprising that the northern cities are cooling dominant, such as Brisbane and Cairns, and the rest are heating dominant. The climate in Sydney represents the climate that is closest to the balanced condition. Finally, it was assumed that heating is not needed in Cairns, as the heating thermal requirement is very low. Based on this energy requirement, five heating and cooling systems are considered in this study. The first is we have a ground source heat pump system, and then we have two different conventional systems. The first is reverse cycle air condition that is used for both heating and cooling. And then we have uh, the same aircon that is used for cooling only, but the heating is provided by gas. And then we have full hybrid system. A hybrid system is a combination between ground source heat pump system, which is designed to provide the base load. And then this is supported by a conventional system during the hottest and coldest day of the year. The proportion between ground source heat pump and conventional system is typically referred as a shame factor in the literature. I will discuss this a bit later on. So we have two different hybrid systems. The first one is combination of ground source heat pump and aircon. And then the second one is combination of ground source heat pump, aircon, and gas furnace. The efficiency of ground source heat pump and aircon system are calculated at every time step. For ground source heat pump, I use the infinite line source model where the entering water temperature and ground temperature are calculated at every time step. For the aircon system, the efficiency just depends with the outside air temperature, and that's also calculated at every time step. I assume the efficiency of gas as constant, 0.9, because that depends on the conversion rate of gas, which is unchanged. The ground heat exchanger length component of the ground source heat pump system is calculated by using this astray design equation. The peak hourly, peak monthly, and average yearly ground load are calculated based on the weather data. The ground temperature is assumed as the mean mean air temperature plus 2 degrees Celsius, as recommended by the XY guideline. All other parameters are assumed the same in between all cities for simplicity. All the installation costs are also kept the same constant, and this is based on the work by Lou et al., which represents typical installation costs found in Australia. One in factor, important factor to note is that we assume that the air condition and gas boiler have a lifespan of 10 years, while the cross heat pump has a lifespan of 20 years. This means that the air con and gas boiler system will have to be replaced at a 10 year point. I use current retail energy prices in each city to calculate the operating cost for all the heating and cooling system. Whenever possible, these prices were calculated from the weighted average from the peak, off peak, and shoulder period. The emission data is taken from the Department of Environment and Energy. So why do we consider a hybrid system? Previously, our monitoring data revealed that the temperate climate in Melbourne is mild enough that we can turn off the heating and cooling system for a significant part of the year. It turns out that the same is true for most Australian cities. So in this section, I will use the weather in Sydney as an example to represent the location with the most balanced climatic condition. So in Sydney, the simulation from Energy Plus suggests that the building requires about 5.8 kilowatt of heating and 7.3 kilowatt of cooling. Now, imagine if we apply a 50% shear factor. A shear factor of 50% means that 50% of the peak heating and cooling load are to be provided by ground source heat pump system. In this case, that would be 2.9 and 3.7 kilowatt. If we do this, then the heating and cooling breakdown looks something like this. So we have the heating and cooling provided by ground source heat pump system, and this area and this area where will be provided by a conventional system. In fact, ground source heat pump system will be able to meet about 91% of the thermal requirement around the year. Doing it this way will reduce the peak capacity of the heat pump effectively by half, which in turn will reduce the ground heat exchanger length as well as the capital cost required to install the system. But how do we know what is the best shear factor to install this hybrid system at? In here, I present the results from two hybrid systems in Sydney. 
The first one on the left is combination of ground source heat pump and aircon. The one on the right is combination of ground source heat pump, aircon, and gas furnace. In the X and Y axis, we have the heating and cooling shear factor, ranging from 0 to 100%. On the bottom left corner, the 0% shear factor represents a conventional system. On the other corner, a 100% shear factor would be the ground source heat pump system. The point in between would represent a heating and cooling shear factor combination for any hybrid system. The contour line here represents a total normalized cost. This is the lifetime cost per megawatt hours to install and operate the system for 20 years. This is similar to the levelized cost of energy, but applied to thermal energy instead. This red point in the middle is what I consider as the lowest normalized cost, or the optimum point. As you can see here, this point, $168 per megawatt hours, is lower than any other point in this heating and cooling shear factor. For this hybrid system, the ground source heat pump needs to be designed to provide about 32% of peak heating and cooling load. Similarly, for the second hybrid system, the lowest normalized cost is at $185 per megawatt hours. For this system, the ground source heat pump needs to provide about 60% peak heating and cooling load. One more thing, in a location with a balanced climatic condition, such as in Sydney, both of the heating and cooling shear factors play some part to the normalized cost, as you can see by the contour, uh, the circular shape of the contour line. In a heating dominant climate, such as in Hobart, only heating of the heating shear factors that play some effect. As you can see, the contour line is more in the vertical orientation. In a cooling dominant climate, in Kent, again, only the cooling shear factor that plays some effect, where the contour line is in horizontal configuration. In this case, the lowest normalized cost is at $148 per megawatt hours, where the heat pump is designed to meet about 38% of the peak load. This hybrid combination reduces the grounded heat exchanger lag requirement by almost half compared to a full ground source heat pump system. The next step is to conduct sensitivity analysis of some key parameters. Changes in any of these parameters can severely impact the financial feasibility of the system. For this presentation, I will just show the first one, which is changes in the drilling cost. The result from before was when the drilling cost is around $80 per meter. Now, imagine if this drilling cost gets cheaper should, uh, to reflect a more competitive environment. As you can see here, uh, with a lower drilling cost at $50 per meter, the lowest normalized cost decreases, and the optimum point shifts towards the ground source heat pump system. It makes sense that if um, in the cheaper drilling cost scenario, that um, ground source heat pump system would be more preferred. On the other hand, if ground source heat pump system gets more expensive, then this lower normalized cost would increase and conventional system would be preferred instead. In fact, when the drilling gets too expensive, such as when the uh, ground condition is very difficult, a more efficient ground source heat pump system is simply not viable at all, and the conventional system would be more financially preferred. The next topic is about the environmental analysis. So we have the lifetime cost in the x-axis and lifetime emission in the y-axis. Both are to install and operate the system for 20 years. The data points here are the, the same heating and cooling shear factor combination shown before. How do we choose the most optimum combination to consider both lifetime cost and emissions? <clears throat> Let me introduce you to the Pareto optimum concept. This is widely used in economics, but have even adapted to the ground source heat pump system, such as by some of the authors listed here. A Pareto optimum solution is a solution set that does, does not exist another shear factor combination with a lower lifetime cost or emission. And this is represented by the black line here. For example, point A and point C here are considered as Pareto optimum, while point B is not. Because at this point, Point B, compared to point C, this point has higher emission for the same amount of cost. Similarly, point B is not efficient because it has more cost for the same of emission compared to point A. So any solution on this line is considered as Pareto optimal. Um, so the solution at point A is the one with the lowest lifetime cost. 
Well, the solution with point C is the one with the lowest lifetime emission. Even though any solution along this line is considered as Pareto optimum, but typically homeowners would prefer solution at point A, where it costs for them the least. However, society or government might prefer you to install a hybrid system at point C, which you have a lowest lifetime emission. This creates some incentive mismatch between individuals and the society. Depending on their environmental goal, government might be able to help to bridging this gap by providing something such as a, a tax credit or by increasing costs through carbon tax. The single most optimum set can be decided depending on the weighted importance of each factor. One solution that has been proposed in the literature is by mathematically calculated the elbow of the curve or the point with the maximum temperature. We can calculate this point, which is point D, uh, which is the point with the highest distance and perpendicular from this line. Note that this point is not always equal as the medium as the median of the Pareto optimum solution, because these points will depend on the relative slope of the curve, and this depending on a range of factors. I'm going to refer to this point as the one with the equal weight solution. So here is the result from Sydney. The red point is the point with the lowest and lowest cost as I've provided before, and I've added the point with the lowest emission and also the point with the equal weight. At this point with the lowest cost, across a hybrid system in Sydney, I need about $40,000 to install and operate for 20 years. But this will generate about 52 tons of emissions. On the other hand, with a different hybrid system mix, it might cost me a bit more, $44,000 but I will emit only around 44 tons of emissions. So comparing this point, this lowest lifetime emission point requires about 10% additional cost, but I can save about 15% additional emission. Now, this equal weight point could be the middle ground approach. Compared to the lowest point, the extra cost that I need to install at this point is not that much, maybe around 2 or 3% but I could significantly reduce emission by about 10%. Similar observation can be made in hybrid system too. However, in this scenario, the Pareto optimum solution curve is much shorter. Furthermore, the potential uh, variance in lifetime cost is slight, quite significantly longer compared to the potential in the lifetime emission. This slide presents the heating and cooling shear factor corresponding to those Pareto optimum solution. So we have the Pareto optimum solution possible represented by the black dots and we have the red, purple and green to reflect the lowest cost, equal weight and lowest emission solution. Again, the lowest cost is the same as before about 30% heating and cooling shear factor. But you can see here, this combination is significantly different than if you want to minimize the lifetime emission. This means that the hybrid system mix needs to be considered carefully depending on the design objective. One further observation, the lowest emission point is actually slightly lower than the full ground source heat pump system at 100% shape factor. Now this is interesting because ground source heat pump system should be the most efficient. So if you want to save emission, you should install at this point. However, at this point, this means that you will the ground source heat pump and the ground heat exchanger will need to be sized to meet the full thermal load. In this case, you will require a very long ground heat exchanger. Installing a slightly smaller ground source heat pump at this point, resulting in lower ground heat exchanger required. That means lower emission generated through the drilling process. So at this point, Actually, the ground source heat pump system is sized to meet the 90% of the peak load. In fact, the ground source heat pump is able to meet 99% of the thermal demand. The less efficient air condition is only used for 20 for, for one day in a year. For hybrid system 2, you can see here that the Pareto optimum solution range is much shorter. This is because ground source heat pump system is significantly more efficient than uh, gas system. So the lowest cost solution is significantly closer towards the right hand corner where ground source heat pump system would be preferred. Now what happens if we change the drilling cost as before? So this is the case when the drilling cost is $80 per meter. 
When drilling costs get cheaper, the Pareto optimum solution range gets shorter, as Kronzos Hippon system is preferred. When this gets more expensive, the range significantly widens give you, to give you a lot more potential combinations with optimum shear factor. However, the range most likely increase just because the lowest cost solution gets closer and closer to conventional system. In fact, at this point, this is the conventional system in Sydney. The lowest emission factor is practically unchanged between its drilling cost and area, as they are effectively represent the Kronzos Hippon system. In summary, our bridge system can be designed to either minimize the lifetime cost or emission, but those solutions are not the same. All stakeholders may consider the weighted importance of each factor. The equals weight solution can be a good alternative, and changes in key parameters will impact the hybrid system feasibility, so they need to be considered properly. The last part of the presentation is about district system. In urban area, buildings are located close to each other, so individual ground source heat pump system at each building can be combined in district arrangement through a common water loop suggestion. <coughs> One key element of this technology is that the thermal energy demand required by its occupants can be unique. For example, in one house one here is Elon with his supercomputer that needs cooling all the time. Next door in Silicon Valley is my billionaire self and I like my house warm. Elon needs cooling and I need heating. In a conventional system, thermal energy from Elon's house is moved outside and essentially wasted to the air. Meanwhile, I use a gas heating to, ex to provide heating for me next door. In a district system, we can move the thermal energy from Elon's house to my house instead. It's like Elon pays for my heating bill. If I need extra thermal energy, then I can use my heat pump to extract additional thermal energy from the ground. So in this research, I calculated 10 different thermal loads to represent possible thermal demands in different buildings. Two of those possible thermal loads are shown here exemplified by my house and Elon's. In a traditional ground source heat pump system, its house will require a very loud ground heat exchanger lag because those houses are heavy cooling dominant or highly heating dominant. In this reconfiguration, instead of taking thermal energy from the ground, such as this scenario, I can extract thermal energy from the common water loop, such as the one that originated from Elon's house. In this scenario, effectively we exchange 70 watt megawatt hours in between the buildings. And hence, because of this, we need a smaller heat pump and then we'll need much shorter ground heat exchanger length. But how do we quantify this benefit? First, I define the total normalized cost as default. This is the lifetime cost per megawatt hours to install and operate the system for 20 years. And then I define this ratio, which is just the ratio between the system in district and individual configuration. I consider combination of different thermal loads. Two, three, and four different thermal load combinations are considered. When I say thermal load combination, it's just how many thermal loads are combined together. So for example, this four thermal load combination can mean that the four of the same thermal load are combined, but that can also mean four of different thermal loads are combined together. Overall, for four thermal load combinations, this result in about 700 unique permutation. Here is the result. So we have a TNC ratio plot for the combination of two, three, or four thermal load. The line here represents the maximum ratio, average, and minimum ratio. So a ratio of one means a combination of the same building, such as my house and my house. So obviously the district is the same ratio as the individual. There is no benefit. As we combine more buildings, this average value decreases, but they will level off, suggests some diminishing return. Furthermore, the area around this plot represents where the data points are located. For two different thermal load combinations, these are located quite closely to the top, which suggests that there is minimum financial benefit of a two district combination. As we combine more buildings, you can see that this uh, probability density are more scattered around the mid. This suggests that as we combine more buildings, it's more likely that any random combination will yield some financial benefit. So in summary, best is to combine heating and cooling dominant buildings. More building combination, the better, but there is diminishing return. And finally, 
as we combine more buildings, it, there will be load diversification, but it will be more likely to get some financial benefit by combining in this next system. But why do we care? The dream is to connect multiple buildings into low energy cities. We have our state-of-the-art campus coming up at Fisherman Bed. The new campus presents a future opportunity to leverage this technology in real world. Under this loan, we can install some grounded exchanges. We can also turn the foundation of this building into energy parks. The buildings can also help to hit and pull each other. And think bigger. The whole precinct will be one of the largest urban renewal project in Australia. Hopefully, my research here can become a starting point. I know that some people in the department have been working to make this happen. Throughout this research, I've had the opportunity to travel some conferences and write some papers and collaborate with others. Here is the list of publications related to this research that has been published or about to be submitted very soon. More importantly, I believe that my biggest contribution is outside these papers. I hope to get some ground source heat pump system installed in some of the residential around here. And some of these are actually have saved some carbon emissions. From time to time, we also bring some students to this property to learn about the system. I believe we also have incrementally furthered the ground source heat pump system industry in Australia. Compared to six, seven years ago when we started, there are significantly more people that know about ground source heat pump system. In consulting, they often discuss about the system whether they can apply it or not. We have even convinced some key stakeholders to do or to let us do a small trial, such as in Melbourne Metro, Melbourne Connect, and in our future campus. All this work will not have been possible without the help of many people. So I would like to thank my supervisors, Guillermo, Ian, Mandy, for all the help, feedback, advice, examples throughout the years. You know, I never imagined eight years ago when I chose a master research project, selecting Guillermo, which leads to uh, eight years of collaboration. And eight years is a very long time. Just an example, throughout these eight years, one of my supervisor, Guillermo, has occupied four different offices. My other supervisor, Ian, actually has retired. <laughs> And even then, Ian still tries to find time on weekend. Last night at 11, he emailed me that he has gone through my abstract for my thesis. So thank you for always finding the time, Ian. Also, uh, my girlfriend, Iris, if you are still connected there, waking up at 5 o'clock, listening to all my complaints, but I never tell you what I actually do. So hopefully this gives uh, some overview. I would like to thank the groups. You guys have been amazing. People think that doing a PhD is lo a lonely journey, but I never feel this. All of you have inspired me, encouraged me, and I'm proud of for all of our achievements. Also, all my family and friends on and off campus uh, keep me happy, encourage me, keep my stress level low. And uh, last but not least, is uh, I would like to thank the uh, Department of Environment, Land, Water, and Planning, especially for providing funding for the first half of this thesis. All the project partners, installers and all the property occupants to allow monitoring of their system. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ryan. For such a clear and vivid presentation. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah. <laughs> I think I've got a question. I'm just gonna try and work out what it actually is. In the earlier part, you demonstrated that there are a lot of properties that hardly use the system at all. Correct. So you've got very low values of up to 36% and the rest are around 6 to 12. Yep. Then the second part, you're talking about all these various factors, but these were done for full Correct. heating and cooling. Yes, it should be used all year round. Right. So. If you would apply the lessons of the first part to the second part, are the conclusions the same? Well, I haven't looked at it, but if I do it, I'm afraid it's not much of a PSC. Because if you think about it, on the first part, most of the houses is not used for, at the very least, a third of the time. That's when you go to work, that's when you sleep, and so on. So if I apply that to the second part, there is not much analysis to be done because that will cut the heating and cooling significantly. 
But what you're saying, if we apply that situation in Australia, we turn things on and off as at will, we're probably not worth putting a ground source heat pump system in. Or residential system, probably not. Residential system. But for commercial, yes. Commercial, yes, commercial. And more extreme temperatures, it probably would be. So overall, for residential properties, it doesn't seem to be a particularly great idea. Probably not under current cost conditions. Under the current cost conditions. <laughs> and environment. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've often thought that, but I could never prove it. <laughs> because like there are so many factors here and things are changed from year to year. If the cost of energy increasing, then ground source heat pump system would be more beneficial. And also, especially in Melbourne, we are the dirtiest state. For every kilowatt hours of electricity you use, that one kilogram of carbon emission right there. So for this reason, that it probably might be worth more. So really, if you, you could get away with maybe uh, 50 or 100 meters of piping, which isn't a massive cost, yeah. where you're starting to get ridiculous costs and emissions, I mean, we're going to close down our coal mines, it's heading that way. We need sources. And this yep. could provide a base load, not a big one, but an adequate one to give us a fairly cheap base load. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Following up on that comment, in playing the temperature, the temperature economic condition to the law of fraction of the same property that we measure in this project. Yep. Uh, but could it be also that the same people, the same the stakeholders, there are people that are also environmental like, conscious and you know, they're very early adopters and therefore they may not use... Well, some, some, some of them does, certainly. But there are some that, for example, um, the, the one that houses controlled by a thermostat, for example, then like the guy, well, I guess I should not say this, but that sounds like automatic, right? It doesn't really care, it doesn't control when we turn on the heating and cooling system, we just want to be uh, comfortable compared to like, on, on the other hand, if you just turn it on based on when you need, you will use the system significantly less because probably you feel you don't need it, you don't turn it on. Any more questions about uh, this? Do you have time? You can, you can make one. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, well, this was a very good uh, overview of what you have done and some of the work that the team has done on this. Uh, so I feel I know probably less than the other supervisors, uh, but that's fine. And my question is about you provide them, you provide a good overview of the system, you know what it means in terms of carbon emission, how for example a, a hybrid system works, the advantages, then you have good examples of a network system, and then you have that graph which shows the how we can call it an optimum point. And uh, if I want to ask you in terms of um, it's a good contribution to the energy, you know, to the industry, the whole world, to the industry, to the uh, and to this field of knowledge. But individually, yourself, because you are a PhD student, of course, uh, within a team, but as an individual PhD student, you need to pinpoint and say that this is the bit that I contributed most uh, during my PhD uh, in a scientific context, you know, not in terms of coming and telling people a network system is better than an individual. What that bit would be? For me, would be adding that would be the environmental assessment. Some people uh, look into this, but there are not many people looking at the, what consider the cost and the emissions at the same point. And even then, I feel that most people just finish at, oh, Pareto optimum solution is not new. But it's like there's been people that are using it, but at the end of the day, suggesting that Oh, that uh, ground source heat pump system, you can emit X emission, you can save that much cost. But not many of them actually suggest that, okay, this may be need to design properly. And um, I probably don't get, I don't get as much as further as I want, but like the one that I show um, the, the middle point that we consider both. And as you can see that um, there is a chance that, for me, I definitely like the lowest cost. But there is the, it's possible that you put a bit more, but you can reduce your emission quite significantly. So this probably more like going to the field of economics, 
which I'm also interested. Probably you can work with government or some policy makers to price what kind of incentive that you need. So I feel that um, when I look into this, that all these different points, um, not many people are actually saying that like, oh, maybe um, principal to consistent is not the best. You need to consider all other factors. In some scenario, principal to consistent system would be good. In some scenario, probably the answer is not. That makes sense? Yes, kind of uh, a long way to go about it. The reason I asked is because, for example, you mentioned the ground temperature. Yeah. Measurement plot. I know a lot of that was done, I guess, by a sport and other people. So I just wanted to know that which is the group that well, that's you yourself um, believe that you have contributed most. Okay. And on that, because I guess I think it's kind of go there. But I have a comment to make. When you showed the graph, yeah. and it might be a difference in opinion, you showed the one with the lowest cost and emission, and then there was one with the lowest emission. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's, it's not a technical comment. I'm going Okay. And it said the one with the lowest cost is what the householder wants. Yeah. And the one with the oh, <laughs> and then the one with the lowest emission is what government wants. And I don't think that's always true. You know, if you look at the current situation of Australia, probably the government wants the federal government wants the one and there are people that they are buying solar hours, they are willing to that's pay true, more. True. So I don't think and then it may vary between a state government, federal government, someone living in Fitzroy to North Queensland. So I don't think yeah, I, so my point was that that's not necessarily accurate representation of uh, because there are people that are happy to pay a little bit more cost. No, that's true. That's true. And there are people in government that they say no, we don't want to, and we just kept going with all the other solutions. So, so there was the bigger speculation. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that evidence. This is what we call sometimes the uh, common sense. Do we have any other questions? Let's up. <laughs> Thank you very much for the very clear presentation. Uh, it, it was amazing uh, from your point of view. Uh, I can relate myself more towards the last stage, towards the common uh, contribution between Elon and you know, so, so that's that was a very nice presentation. I'm, I'm sure behind all this slide, there's tons of simulation and uh, background study uh, sitting. Uh, my personal question is not basically a comment, it's a question that when you are talking about the common area, how did you design it? Is it a single pipe? Is it double pipe? Is it a one cold pipe? That's a very good question. <laughs> Actually, I simply assumed that, uh, no, I did not look into it, to be honest, because I'm just looking into this into the analytical. So it's just more like a feasibility of uh, the business system itself. That's what you can say. That's what you say. To make this actually happen, yes, you need to look into it. If it should be a single pipe, should be it should be a double pipe, should it be at what diameter, uh, how big is the pipe, at what depth, do we need a storage tank in the middle, do we need to consider the pumping cost? I actually look into it. If I assume, because this assumes heating and cooling uh, runs all year, if I assume a pump, a small pump also run all year, to move uh, water in between the houses that will increase the annual cost by about 10 to 15 percent which is quite significant so yes and you also need to consider how to minimize the thermal loss because just storing hot water even in the pipe moving around there will be some thermal loss when the water moving from house a to house b and right now i simply like right heating dominant heating a uh, cooling dominant house next to each other in reality one could be here one could be in the sports center. So that also needs to be considered. So, so yes. You say that at the moment, what you present is more toward the concept rather than Yeah, concept. more like the feasibility, I guess. It's, like it's a starting point. Side so can continue this. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Move forward. All right, I think that was a couple of the questions. Uh, let's rejoin me once again, Sheik, in, in terms of taking right to the next question. Maybe the final, final, final. <laughs> <laughs>